Good afternoon and welcome to the Education Committee's hearing on legislation concerning gay, straight, or gender sexuality alliances at DOE schools. Today we will, we will hear testimony on introduction number 1638, sponsored by Councilmember Ben Kalos and myself, and resolution number 1442, which I am proud to sponsor. I'll talk more about this bill and resolution shortly after some opening remarks, and then we'll hear from Councilmember Kalos. Supporting LGBTQ students in our city schools has been a focus of this committee this session. We have held past oversight hearings that have highlighted the challenges that LGBTQ students face in schools, including bullying, harassment, and discrimination, both at the hands of their peers as well as through school policies. And we have learned that consequently, many LGBTQ students face academic hardship as they are more likely to miss school days and have more difficulty focusing on their academic work. According to national surveys, many of these incidents go unreported, and alarmingly, some incidents that are reported are ignored by school staff. It's clear, therefore, that reactive measures are not enough to help these students. Schools must be proactive in providing effective programming, counseling, and other supports to create a safe school environment where all students feel welcome and valued. Supporting LGBTQ students has been a top priority of this council. In fiscal year 2016, the council allocated $100,000 for a DOE LGBTQ liaison, and an additional $100,000 was allocated to support professional development for teachers in LGBTQ curriculum. In fiscal year 2017, at the council's urging, DOE baseline funding for the DOE's LGBTQ liaison, and the council allocated $200,000 to the LGBTQ Inclusive Curriculum Initiative. This effort will continue in fiscal year 2018 with $350,000 to support WNET, Lambda Literary, and History Unerased, which each provide LGBT inclusive curriculum materials and professional development for educators. Additionally, working together with the administration, we were able to secure an additional $500,000 in funding to support the work of the LGBTQ liaison. While much valuable programming exists, this hearing will focus on gender sexuality or gay-straight alliances, GSAs, which are student groups that have the primary purpose of providing a safe space for students to discuss issues of sexuality and gender and combating homophobia and transphobia. According to research, students attending schools with a GSA feel more connected to their schools, experience lower rates of victimization related to their gender expression and sexual orientation, and are less likely to feel unsafe because of their sexual orientation when compared to their peers who do not have a GSA. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the students from the Manhattan Leadership Council and East Side Middle School in Council Member Kalos District, who testified before the Education Committee at the Council's hearing on bullying, harassment, and discrimination in New York City schools last October. The legislation that you suggested to the Council played a significant role in the Council's preparation for today's hearing. On behalf of the Committee on Education, I would like to thank you for taking the initiative to speak out on an issue of importance, submitting draft language for the resolution, and having the courage to have your voices heard. It certainly had an impact. As I stated earlier, we will hear testimony today on intro 1638 which would require the DOE to report on whether each public school has a GSA, including information about monetary and other supports provided to such GSAs, and how many meetings are held by GSAs, and any efforts to promote and maintain GSAs in schools. Additionally, we will hear testimony on resolution number 1442, which would call upon the New York City Department of Education to create and maintain a functional GSA in all middle and high schools in order to support LGBTQ and other vulnerable students. I strongly believe in ground up, ground up grassroots movements to bring about the change. 
But in this case, a message from the top can make all the difference. Teachers need to know that they are supported in their efforts to assist their LGBTQ students and that they have this support from the highest levels of the Department of Education. If you wish to testify on intro 1638 or resolution 1442, please indicate on the witness slip whether you are here to testify in favor of or in opposition to the legislation. I also want to point out that we will not be voting on the bill or resolution today as this is just the first hearing. To allow as many people as possible to testify, testimony will be limited to three minutes per person. Please note that all witnesses, all witnesses will be sworn in before testifying. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Councilmember Ben Kalos, to say a few words. First, I just want to thank uh, Danny Drum for his lifetime of service as a uh, teacher in our public schools, uh, for fighting for LGBT curriculum going back almost more than a generation, not to betray any part of his age, because he's still young and amazing, uh, and also as being what I think is the best education chair who's really focused on these issues and even held a hearing on bullying and uh, its impact on the LGBTQ community. So I just want to thank you and thank you for making this happen. Um, I'm, we wouldn't be in this process if you didn't believe in empowering our youth uh, to the point that uh, they will have had a role in drafting legislation, seeing it introduced and testifying today. And uh, it's 2017. And uh, we shouldn't have to be here talking about this uh, today. And it's kind of hard to imagine uh, that uh, we need to talk about supporting and protecting LGBTQ New Yorkers. But according to the NYPD, hate crimes have doubled since last year, with anti-transgender incidents cited as a major cause. We have an administration in DC that does not support marriage equality, that is willing to discriminate against transgendered Americans, who have served in our military and protecting every single one of us and who want to serve uh, their country and who are willing to support businesses which discriminate against LGBTQ customers and attempting to roll back so many decades of progress. And, all the clim and although the climate is very different here in New York City where we actually have human rights protections uh, for gender and sexual identity, What's happening in the White House still has an impact here, and it's our moral duty to support our fellow New Yorkers, no matter who they are or who they love. Gender Sexuality Alliances, or Gay Straight Alliances, GSAs, are student-led organizations that bring together LGBTQ students with allies to provide a safe place to meet, have discussions, offer support, plan events and activities. According to Advocates for Children of New York, the presence of a GSA in schools, as the chair mentioned, decreases anti-LGBTQ bullying and harassment and makes students feel safer and more comfortable. These organizations are a powerful message that being who you are is your right and that our students deserve the opportunity to figure out who they are without fear of bullying and harassment. Um, it's also worth noting that it's th through this process um, I do want to just thank our committee counsel, Sumita Deshmukh, and uh, Jan Etwell, who met with the students multiple times as we figured out what we could do around this space uh, to support them. And just uh, uh, Principal David Getz, uh, who is never shy when it comes to anything that could possibly be controversial, even though this, sh again, should not be controversial in 2017 and empowering his students to march into council members' offices or the chair of the Education Committee to demand legislation. And I hope that every student in the city learns that lesson and begins going to their individual council members to demand similar legislation to make their world a uh, better place. And I think one of the things that also came out of the conversations was that our curriculum in the schools, which is also something that we're not able to perhaps legislate around, wasn't going into gender or sexual identity and wasn't telling kids that they might be born cisgendered or transgendered or not gender nonconforming or that uh, they, they may have different sexual orientations and uh, 
Teen Vogue had quite a controversy when they actually did a article explaining different uh, ways to engage in sexual activity. And again, 2017. Introduction 1638 was inspired by the East Side Middle School students who are uh, here and part of the Manhattan Leadership Council. Some of them have already graduated to go on to great high schools. Uh, some of them uh, went to Bronx Science. Some of them went to not as great a school, Stuyvesant, but uh, we can forgive them for that. I'm a Bronx High School of Science graduate. Uh, and uh, so we have a group of kids from all over the city who are here to testify, and I welcome them and, uh, co uh, and congratulate them in engaging in their civic duty. Uh, the legislation which the students helped author requires the Department of Education to report annually on the presence of GSAs in our public schools, uh, whether or not they have meetings, and uh, we were trying to find indicia to show whether or not they were actually active or just they were there on a piece of paper without having any meetings, and we're interested in learning from the students uh, as well as advocates and others how we can make improvements to really support our students, and I want to thank Chair Drum. And, I know I may have gone on, but I appreciate everything that everyone's doing here today because it's incredibly beautiful uh, to fight the hate we see in D.C. here in New York City with love. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councilmember Kalos. And you're right, it is incredibly beautiful, especially when we see legislation initiated by students from our own public school system. And I think that's really what today's hearing is mostly all about. And I also want to thank you for your um, stellar uh, support as an ally of the community. And it's uh, really, that's how we succeed, is that um, having allies like you um, supporting resolutions and introductions as we're hearing today uh, is really, um, really very, very, very important to, uh, to this movement Thank you. for equality. Thank you. Um, I want to say that we have been joined by Council Member Mark Levine, uh, Council Member Rafael Salamanca, Council Member Alan Maisel, Council Member Chaim Deutsch, and Council Member Inez Barron as well. Uh, and from there, we're going to now go to swearing in our um, folks from the DOE. So if I can ask you to raise your right hand. Um, and we are joined today by Jay Murray. Uh, we're joined by Lois Herrera and Jared Fox. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. I do. Thank you very much. So who would like to start? I will. Jay, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the Education Committee. I am Jay Murray, Executive Director of the New York City Department of Education's Office of Counseling Support Programs. I am joined by Lois Herrera, Chief Executive Officer of the Office of Safety and Youth Development, and by Jared Fox, the DOE's LGBT Community Liaison. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss intro number 1638, which would require DOE to report information on Gender Sexuality Alliances, GSAs. Before I go further, I want to thank Chair Drum and the City Council for your leadership and partnership on this important issue. Through your strong voice, we have an LGBT community liaison and a gender equity coordinator. And this year, we will be able to support additional LGBT programming and initiatives. We anticipate being able to extend our reach across schools in a number of areas, including supporting student clubs like GSAs. The DOE works to ensure that all of our schools maintain a safe, inclusive, and supportive learning environment, including for our LGBT students, families, and staff. GSAs are one of a broad range of interventions and supports available to LGBT students, families, and staff. These resources are also important for allies, children of LGBT parents, and those who are coming to understand LGBT identity. We know that many times, even in schools where GSAs are present, they are not, they are not the only pillar of support. We encourage not only the creation of GSAs and the inclusion of LGBT curriculum into classrooms, but also training for staff members on terminology and resources for LGBT students. Creating environments that affirm LGBT students is a multi-pronged approach, and we recognize GSAs as one element of this approach. We are grateful to the Council for supporting this holistic vision through funding programs such as the Lambda Literary Writers in Schools program, which has been a successful means of incorporating LGBT content into classrooms and GSAs. We also saw during our June 2017 LGBT Inclusive Curriculum Conference that many attendees were both teachers and GSA advisors. We are proud that many of our efforts have been ahead of their time. 
thus paving the way for inclusion and affirmation of LGBT identity in New York City and across the country. Our transgender student guidelines, initially launched in March 2014, are one such exa example. In March 2017, we issued updated transgender and gender nonconforming student guidelines. These guidelines were expanded to provide more comprehensive and specific guidance and to reflect best practices. Following the release of these updated guidelines in May 2017, we announced that all students will have access to single stall student restrooms and work has already begun to convert these restrooms. Student and families in schools where the change has occurred have applauded the effort and we will continue to make these changes until we reach all schools. Our work to support LGBT students and staff is supported by several community partners through our LGBT Advisory Council. The Council was established in March 2014 and since its creation has expanded to include 34 participating organizations that meet regularly to offer support and resources to LGBT students, families, and staff. It is important that our work is done in a partnership with communities. In times of uncertainty, the DOE has doubled down our efforts to affirm LGBT students, families, and staff. We have shown this commitment publicly through our annual Pride Celebration at Tweed and through our participation in borough-based Pride events. Our Queen's Pride contingent was the recipient of the Simply the Best Award, and in the heritage of Pride March, our float and marching contingent exceeded 200 people. We were happy to be joined by Council Member Drum during both of these marches. Thank you again for your continued support. Our efforts to support LGBT identity are not only provided by the Office of Counseling Support Programs. The Office of School Wellness Programs, for instance, provides trainings on how to teach comprehensive health education inclusive of LGBT individuals. The Office of School Wellness Programs also hosts a webinar where upon completion, school staff can wear Out for Safe School badges as symbols to students of a safe and supportive environment for LGBT students. Last but not least, the Office of Safety and Youth Development's Respect for All initiatives focus on school climate and culture. In addition to the required training for RFA liaisons, over 1,000 DOE staff completed RFA Cognito online training on supporting LGBT students. We are in the process of developing three more Cognito online training simulations, one of which specifically targets LGBT issues. An entire day of our annual RFA week in February will be focused on LB LGBT themes. We want to thank the City Council for being our partner in this work. We know that there is more work to be done. To that end, we are continuing to expand services and supports to school leaders, teachers, other staff and students, and are increasing the citywide focus on LGBT inclusive curriculum. Again, your commitment and support for all NYC students and the LGBT youth of our city is both inspiring and critical to the work we have been doing and will continue to do with your partnership. I would now like to turn to Jared Fox, who will update the committee on his work with GSAs. We will then be happy to answer any questions you may have. Our work in supporting GSAs is personal for me. I was 14 years old when I started the process to create the first GSA in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. GSAs create a space for LGBT and allied students to socialize, support one another, and advocate for inclusive practices in their schools. We know that LGBT students are vulnerable and face unique challenges, and I saw firsthand how other students and staff were impacted by having a GSA at my school. We have traditionally seen these clubs at the high school level, but are seeing an increasing number of clubs in middle school settings and even one elementary school. An informal count of GSAs done through principals and Respect for All liaisons indicated about 200 GSAs around the city with over 150 of those clubs in high schools. We have even started a GSA for central office staff. The NYC Schools Pride Employee Resource Group brings together LGBT and allied staff across all five boroughs for social and educational events. An expansion of GSAs in District 2 middle schools stems from the advocates advocacy of students from Eastside Middle School. This amazing group of young people recognize the importance of GSAs and the impact it had on their school. Together with Superintendent Bonnie LeBoy and Principal David Goetz, they help middle schools in their district see the benefits of having GSAs. These students have also inspired the proposed legislation we are considering, and we commend them for their advocacy on behalf of all students. The DOE supports the creation of these clubs and schools. 
and our work to support student clubs of all types is supported by Chancellor's Regulation A601. Consistent with the requirements of the Federal Equal Access Act of 1984, this regulation provides that all student clubs and organizations that are similarly situated must be treated equally. In addition, they must be student-initiated and open to all students, have a purpose that is aligned to the school's educational goals, have a pedagogical employee as the faculty advisor, and be approved by the student government and principal. While the regulation prohibits DOE from mandating that schools create a GSA or any other student club, the DOE supports the creation of GSAs in schools where students initiate them. I have been able to provide personalized support to schools that want to start GSAs, have questions in relation to them, and want education on LGBT topics. Research by GLSEN has shown that the presence of a GSA has a positive influence on climate and culture in a school with students reporting lower incidences of bullying and harassment on the basis of sexual orientation in these schools. GLSEN even celebrated one of our GSAs from the Academy for Young Writers in East New York as their 2016 National GSA of the Year. We have also heard powerful testimonies to our work from students who specifically sought to apply to a high school that had a GSA. We are very happy that School Finder now allows students participating in the high school admissions process to search for terms such as LGBT or GSA when researching schools. For example, a student looking for a high school in Brooklyn with a GSA might put LGBT and Brooklyn into the School Finder and find the Leanne Goldstein High School for Sciences in Sheepshead Bay. This year, we will offer guidance to schools on how to list their GSA so that students interested in having this opportunity in high school can search with clarity. We are also excited about our plans to support GSAs through the creation of an LGBT events calendar, complete with LGBT resources, a list of partner community-based organizations, and FAQs about how to start a GSA, a GSA starter kit that has materials such as posters, buttons, and literature to help newly formed GSAs kick off their programming, an expansion of the annual GSA Summit. For the past two years, the Office of School Wellness Programs has held a GSA Summit for 26 schools as part of their federal grant. Because of the Council's support, we can expand this GSA Summit to any school that would like to attend with workshops for faculty advisors and workshops tailored specifically for students. In addition, this school year, we will heighten our efforts to message to field support centers, administrators, superintendents, and school-based staff the benefits of sponsoring clubs that represent student diversity and interest, including GSAs. I will now turn to the proposed legislation. Intro number 1638 requires the DOE to report information on GSAs in schools. Specifically, the bill would require the DOE to report on, among other reporting requirements, whether a school has a GSA, the number of meetings held by the GSA, the number of members, whether teachers or parents are involved, and the number of teachers that have received training related to GSAs. Will we support the goal of the proposed legislation to ensure that students, families, and members of the school community and other stakeholders have information regarding whether a school has a GSA? we have some concerns regarding the scope of the reporting requirements. We do not currently track detailed information such as the bill proposes about any student club or alliance, and we are reluctant to single out a specific club for such detailed information. In addition, we do not have an existing mechanism to capture detailed school level information on GSAs or any other student club. It is challenging to impose another reporting requirement on school principals as they already devote considerable time to meeting federal, state, city, and DOE reporting requirements. We believe maintaining information on whether schools have a GSA is important for school communities and the DOE, and we look forward to working with the Council to narrow the scope of the proposed legislation to meet the goals of providing useful information without burdening schools with added data collection. Thank you again for your leadership and financial commitment that the City Council provides. Much of what we do would be greater challenge, and in some instances, not at all possible without all of your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I uh, really appreciate your testimony here today. Um, just before we get started with questions, I want to say we've been joined by Councilmember Vincent Gentili from Brooklyn and as well. And, I'm sorry, and Dan Garodnik is also here as well. Um, Thank you, um, both Jay and Jared, for your um, informative testimony. And you actually saved a few surprises for me, which I thought was great. 
Uh, an entire day of our annual RFA week in February will be focused on LGBT issues. How do you see that happening and, and manifesting itself? Um, for the last two years, uh, we have uh, attached a theme to each of the days of the RFA week. Um, and so this is, has been part of the week. Um, and it's becoming uh, institutionalized so that schools know, one, to expect that RFA week is the week before the February break, and two, to realize that there are themes that uh, are attached to each day. Do you track that? Do you hold on to that information? Do you know what it is that the teachers are doing so that it could be you know, used as an example for other schools? We do receive notice from schools, and we are able to share best practices. Uh, we've been able to post videos and pictures and artifacts that schools submit to us, but we do not track it uniformly across the system. Uh, but we do have examples of best practice to share. The annual RFA recognition ceremony seeks to memorialize some of the great contributions that schools have made. I was actually the host of this last year's RFA recognition ceremony. Um, and so we recognize and celebrate schools that do amazing things during respect. At the holiday. RFA ceremonies, do you mention that the projects that the schools are um, being acknowledged for? Yes, and this past year we actually, you're familiar with the Kids for LGBT Rights video, we actually played that for all attendees at the RFA recognition ceremony and celebrated that school's contribution uh, to creating a respectful school. Okay, climate. that's fantastic because that is actually where I also met the Kids for LGBT Rights was at the Respect for All ceremony. So, uh, and it was because I used the LGBT words in my speech that day that then the teachers were coming over to me, otherwise I probably wouldn't have been aware of what they were doing in that school. So. Again, good, and, and, and while I'm on that topic, let me, before I go to the next question, affirm the importance of the pride events that you're doing. Uh, you know, as an activist, you know, I've always said that the biggest enemy of the LGBT community is invisibility. And so having pride events, whether they be at Tweed or at the Queen's Pride Parade or in the Manhattan Pride Parade are really really important because that's how we fight that invisibility is by being seen at those events. And I have to tell you, I was really deeply moved to see IS-230 marching in the Queen's Pride Parade this year with their banner being led by yourself and parents from the school. And that came about because of your intervention in that school. I believe that when the principal, Mr. Zirin, um, contacted your office about two young girls who had just come out of the closet and he wanted to know how to go about dealing with the situation. And so um, for me, that's really um, hugely important to have, and, and they did it in their own neighborhood, which is really so important to me as well, is that they were able to march in their own neighborhood, gay and straight kids, you know? And I think that's really, that's why I also like the gender sexuality alliances. Uh, the other surprise that I, I heard uh, you mention was that uh, you said in your testimony, we are very happy that School Finder now allows students participating in the high school admissions process to search for the terms such as LGBT or GSA when searching schools. Can you just tell me about that? What, what would pop up if they did? So every school in the School Finder um, application submits a, a number of information that then is in the printed high school directory. Schools often submit information on student clubs into the student information directory. They may submit that they have a glee club, an art club, GSA is one of those. One of the issues is that schools list GSA sometime as GSA, Gender and Sexuality Alliance, Gay Straight Alliance. So this year we're going to offer some specific guidance on how to list a GSA so that it's consistent. But if you type in LGBT and Queens or Brooklyn, it'll pop up schools that have put those terms into their school profile. So I can find which schools have a GSA and publicly list it as part of their school's profile in the school finder. I know at the um, Manhattan Pride Parade when we marched, um, uh, one of the largest contingents within the DOE um, group was um, one of the high schools from Staten Island. Is it Richmond? Tottenville. Tottenville. They have a GSA? They have a GSA, um, and they were over 50 young people from Tottenville High School, so large that they actually had to get a bus to get the kids there. Do they have it listed on their website that they have a GSA? I am not sure. I know that their GSA actually has a, their own Twitter, Twitter and Instagram account 
So there is uh, a Tottenville GSA Instagram account specifically for LGBT kids at Tottenville. So I think it was another high school in um, Susan Wagner in, 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 um, in Staten Island as well. So I think when I went to their website and I looked, it was there amongst the list of clubs, and I was really happy to see it. That may be a way that the DOE can also begin to promote this, is to ask principals if they have it to include it on their websites. And I, I would really like to suggest that you do that, because I think that's really important as well. Um, just overall, um, in terms of your testimony, uh, and, and, and people in the public may be wondering, you know, okay, I'm all right with this in high schools, but why middle schools? You know, why do we have to do this in middle schools? I'm just curious, I mean, I know what I would say, but I'm just curious what the department is thinking in terms of why it's so important to have GSAs in middle schools. So, so I would say I remember what it was like for me as a middle school kid. And a lot of times there are those, you're starting to prep for high school, there might be, you start to have school dances, and you see everybody around you engaging in sort of rites of passage, and you feel sometimes really left out. And I think that's me as, a, as an individual, as a person, and my own, thinking about my own development. Um, it, it was really important for me as a freshman in high school, as a first year student, to start this process to start a GSA, because I, I remembered what it was like, and I didn't want to feel as alone. Um, I think that in terms of development of young people, and maybe uh, Jerry Lois have something to add, but I, I think it's middle school is an, an important time for our young people. Um, it's a crucial time. I mean, I think one of the best things about GSAs is the fact that nobody is required to identify as being LGBT or not. It's just a group for those who would be supportive of those who are. And I think that's one of the things that I find most attractive about it is that we're not asking students to um, identify as LGBT per se. Uh, they may be, you know, and especially when you consider the spectrum, the fluidity of sexuality that occurs, um, but this is a safe place for every student in a school uh, to be. And I, and I think that's also a very important message to send to the middle schoolers uh, so that for those who may be questioning their sexuality, they know that there are others there to support them. It's also the intersection of identity. Correct. That none of our LGBT young people are ever just LGBT. They might also be a person of color, first generation. Um, so I think it's really important that we provide outlets for our young people to come together with all of their identities in a supportive space. In your testimony, uh, you mentioned the fact that you don't track uh, school clubs uh, and that it would be difficult just to track one uh, club, a GSA, per se. Um, but you do track uh, respect for all liaisons. Is there a way for us to tap into um, the respect for all liaisons to report back to the DOE about which schools might have GSAs so that we can do a more targeted approach in terms of encouraging schools to establish the GSAs? Yes, we, we believe very strongly that we will be able to um, identify which schools have GSAs, much in the same way we track who is, um, who is the RFA liaison in every school. And would that be done through the, through the liaison? Is that how you're imagining possibly doing it? No, every school fills out a consolidated plan um, at, by October 31st of the year, um, and we believe that we, that might be the way to track GSAs. Okay, and then I noticed in your testimony as well that you said that um, you estimate that you have, it might have been in uh, Ms. Murray's testimony, that you have approximately about 200 GSAs existing now. How do you come up with that number? So we, before the legislation came about, um, started, we're really curious about the number of GSAs. And really, after we met with the District 2 young people, I was curious about the total numbers that we had in the school system. There was no cons consolidated record of them, so we devised a two-question survey. Do you have a GSA? Yes, check that box, let us know the advisor. If you check no, check a box and let us know why you don't have a GSA. Those were two questions. 
Uh, we send it to every principal through the Principal Weekly, which is how principals typically keep track of their um, surveys and requirements. We then followed up that announcement and request with a follow-up announcement, and then schools that had not responded, um, we sent an email directly to the Respect for All liaison, and then the fourth time was if the Respect for All liaison didn't respond, we sent a follow-up email. So four targeted outreaches directly to schools yielded a little over a thousand responses. When we narrowed down the number of responses, and, and this was um, to all schools, uh, junior, elementary, middle, was every school because we didn't want to single out just middle school and high school. We figured we would get really great information and data points back. So in elementary schools, often the response was, "We don't have any clubs at all." So a lot of elementary schools don't do uh, extracurricular clubs. They may do academic enrichment or club sports after school, but never like a sewing club, a theater arts club after school. Um, and in our middle schools and high schools, often the response was, yes, we have a GSA, or no, we don't have a GSA. We're in the process of starting one. That was often sometimes the response. And that was great because I was able to send them resources and support. But we never really heard things that let us know that they that there were problems that were starting them. So this was sort of our first data point in trying to figure out how many GSAs we had. We had about 200. We then asked all of our community organizations that work with GSAs to provide us lists of their GSAs that they utilize, and we were able to cross-reference those lists and find a couple more that maybe CBOs had that we didn't know about or that we had that CBOs also had to confirm uh, that. Uh, did you break it down by, uh, by um, level? We did. Um, so there were 1,079 responses. We surveyed uh, only the public schools. We actually didn't survey charter schools um, from this response. Uh, 95 middle schools. Um, it was 95 middle schools, and I think it was a little over 130. It was just a little over 200. Um, so it was about 20% of the schools that we surveyed um, and it, that responded indicated that they had a GSA. And did you have any on the elementary level? We had one elementary school GSA uh, in Manhattan at the Earth School. Right. Okay. Um, what kind of activities or events do the GSAs hold for students? So they range, GSA programs range from social to support to advocacy. So social events are, you know, hey, let's come hang together, watch a movie. Um, support is sort of coming out story opportunities. So around October is National Coming Out Day on October 11th, so a lot of GSAs will hold the National Coming Out Day event. And then there's advocacy events, which are really around changing especially in the political times, changing the narrative around what LGBT young people need. So those are things like the Day of Silence that happens every year around March or April where young people take a vow of silence. So programs really range in those three buckets, social, support, and advocacy. So, you know, when I, heard, when I held the first hearing in February of 14, um, a young uh, man, transgender man, came in and told us that he had gone to seven staff members in his school to ask them uh, to work uh, uh, with him in terms of forming a GSA in the school. One of the reasons why we are very interested in this legislation is because we in the council feel that students should not have to um, go through that. It's particularly difficult because for young people, the process of coming out in itself is difficult, and then to go to an adult in the school and ask them to form a club for them um, is even more difficult. How are you dealing with that? How, so that we can prevent a student having to go to seven staff members. Um, well, Chancellor's Regulation A601 reflects the Equal Access Act of 1984, which is a federal law, which says that for any student, club, or organization um, that is non-curricular um, must be student-initiated and student-led. Um, we would expect 
um, the students would be able to talk to their principal and be able to express interest in having such a club initiated. And then it would really be on the principal to find a faculty advisor because both the Equal Access Act and our own Chancellor's Reg mandates that there be a, a, a pedagogical uh, facilitator or uh, staff member who can um, be there to support the club. So um, we're very supportive of GSAs. We feel very passionately about them. Um, while we're not aware of students who've had difficulties starting GSAs, if we should become aware, we will definitely uh, look into each case and see if we can help remove the barriers that might exist. I think that's a really important point. And uh, one principal, I'm forgetting what school that I talked at, uh, spoke at, or went to visit actually, uh, it was a combo PSIS, I think. Um, but they put up the posters that you provided them with, the LGBT specific posters, and that alone got a student to go to the teacher or to the principal to um, ask if they could do that. So are we continuing to send out those posters? Yes. How often do you send out the posters? Is it done yearly or? It's, it's annual, it's once a year. It's once a year? At the same time that we send out the Respect for All posters. And it's also available on the website so anyone could print it out. Okay, because just the, the, the presence of those signs in schools has initiated, um, you know, responses from students to, to ask to have the clubs, and I think that that, again, is very important. Um, I do have other questions, but I know we have other council members here who probably have questions as well, so I'm going to turn it over to council member Ben Kalos. I want to thank the chair for his exhaustive questions, uh, many of which I am glad he was uh, Before we start, let me just say we've been joined by Councilmember Chin and Councilmember Rosenthal. So, first thing, just uh, in, you, in your response to uh, Chair Drum's questions, you indicated that following the hearing and following this legislation, you actually affirmatively started to, before the legislation even passed, you've already started to reach out to schools. So, so these kids have already had an impact. Yes, 100%. That is great. And so, um, would you be willing to share the, the schools, uh, the, the 200 schools that you've gotten? Is that something you feel comfortable sharing publicly, sharing with our committee and with us to, to have an idea around or? Uh, yeah, I would bring that back and we can work through all the protocols of sharing that information. Yeah. And so I think part of this is we, we were all together at uh, Wagner uh, with the Manhattan Leadership Council as they were seeking about how to bring it beyond District 2. Uh, and so in your testimony you mentioned an LGBT advisory council that had 34 participating organizations. Now you have, a, uh, you have 200. Uh, what does the future look like in terms of for facilitating getting those 200 student groups together to benefit from one another's uh, experience and also make sure that they have access to all the resources you have to provide? So a quick point of clarification would be that our advisory council is typically community-based organizations. So the 34 organizations that meet regularly are uh, CBOs and community-based organizations. We had mentioned in the testimony that we will be holding a GSA summit uh, this, this year in, in January, actually. Um, so we hope to bring together the 200 uh, schools during that time and offer separate workshops for the young people um, about how to run a GSA meeting, and then for the advisors as well. Um, and then before that even happens, though, we want to bring together the advisors to survey them in a roundtable fashion around what are the issues and things that they're experiencing so that we can then cater the programming of the summit directly towards their needs. In, in, a, in a world where I'm hoping the folks in the audience are uh, Facebooking and tweeting and Instagramming and folks are watching at home online. If they want to go to this conference that you're planning in January, how, how do they raise their hand? How do they get an invite? I, I, I know this, the chair wants to go. I, I want to go too. How do we, how do we participate? Yeah, so it will be a, an open event for schools and we would hope that you all would be special guests and join us for that day. Um, all of our LGBT resources, my information, a lot of people find it just by going to schools.nyc.gov. Um, and when you type in LGBT there, my email address and phone number, are they pop up as well as a lot of our other LGBT support. So, so if folks are watching at home and are interested, what, what is the best email for them to 
go for? Yeah, so it would be, uh, you would just pride, P-R-I-D-E, at schools.nyc.gov. That that's is, sort of our catch-all email address that's easy to remember to spell, pride at schools.nyc.gov. Uh, and so, uh, one, uh, just to follow along with the chair, I, I love the, uh, so, so I'm a person of the Jewish faith when I was applying to, to colleges, one of the things that there was a checkbox for was like, do they have a Hillel, uh, which is a, a Jewish student organization, and that was an indicia for me whether or not they had a strong Jewish piece. But the, the stronger piece was, do they serve kosher food? Because I, I tend to eat kosher meat when I can, otherwise I'm vegetarian. So uh, versus having a, uh, a keyword search where you've mentioned that you have to rely on information being put in and just as a computer scientist, it's possible just to have a, a checkbox so somebody searching can check and uh, versus having to rely on the user picking the right keyword and reading your instructions as well as the uh, principal or other uh, employee entering the right keyword. So it's something we can take back to the, the enrollment team. Um, there have been conversations about making it easy and um, that the data is clean. As somebody who used to work in, in the IT division for the Department of Ed, I can appreciate the data scientists wanting to be like, this is exactly the same terminology that we use or keyword that we use. So it's something that we can take back to the enrollment team um, and to share with them uh, how we can work together on this. So something that the uh, kids were really uh, strong advocates for, and now that I'm in the council, the budget for the city, which is $85 billion and change, is, is in a way a little less about money and more about priorities. And so the kids were fairly forceful with me about insisting that the GSAs have a budget, uh, that this DOE is showing that you're serious. and. Uh, Having been a student in a public school trying to convince multiple faculty advisors, I'll, I'll admit this one, uh, it's been a while, uh, we wanted to start a science fiction club because uh, back in the 90s being a nerd was not uh, as chic as it is today and we could not get the, we couldn't find the staffers, we couldn't get the funding and then the kids did not have the income to pay into being a member which we would then pool together to pay the faculty advisor. Uh, what can the, is the DOE willing to uh, and have capacity to uh, share the amount that you have budgeted and are we, will you put your money where your mouth is and budget to cover the cost of the pedagogical employees because a lot of them do many more hours of work than they should but as an employer all of us we should be paying them for their time and encouraging them to do so so that it is easier for a student to find an advisor than not. So we totally understand the want and need to show the importance of GSAs, um, but because GSAs are student initiated and run clubs, individual GSAs are supported within a, a school based on the school's student fair funding. Um, and not centrally. Uh, none of our clubs are funded centrally. Providing funding for GSAs and not to other non-curricular clubs could violate the Equal Access Act, and all student-run clubs must be treated equally. Can a council member set aside discretionary funding to DOE to fund clubs, a, a GSA club in particular? It, it would, we'd have to check on that. Okay, that, that is disappointing, but do you have the capacity to report on the budgets of the GSAs? Um, no, we do not. Okay, uh, with regard to the, the struggle of trying to find the actual teachers to be the uh, advisors, uh, how, how many of your teachers have, is, is there such thing as training to be a GSA advisor? So. In response to some requests that we had around what does a GSA advisor do um, and policies and protocols, I developed a full day training that we piloted last year around starting and supporting GSAs at your school. 
We actually originally ran it for District 2 based on their leadership in this area, ran it for um, some, of the, some of the schools there, principals would send people based on their availability, um, and we're actually going to be doing it a couple more times this year to kind of fine tune it. With any training, I always want to start small, and then we can roll it out citywide to learn from what we do. So we are in the process of developing a full day training that would help to empower advisors to understand best practices and things that might happen as a GSA advisor. There is not an official curricula. Um, we have always learned the best from existing advisors. Um, and so that's something we'll continue to do to be able to support. I also just want to underscore, GSAs are one of many different supports that we provide to kids. And sometimes in our most vulnerable communities, um, a GSA isn't enough, right? If a kid is, is, doesn't have a place to go at night, an optional student club isn't going to give them a place to sleep that night. And so it's one element of all of the funding that we're looking at when we think about how we support holistically all of our LGBT kids, their families, the staff members. Um, so that's a multi-pronged answer, I guess. I'm gonna go on a quick tangent because it appear to have opened the door in that direction. Our sex ed starts in middle schools. Uh, what is the Department of Education doing to make sure that the sex ed curriculum actually includes uh, gender and sexuality education that is not um, heteronormative or or, uh, or, or uh, oriented towards one type of sexuality? So our Office of School Wellness Programs um, which is our partner office, does oversee the health education curriculum. Um, we actually believe that our sex ed starts even before middle school in getting young people to understand healthy relationships and um, what, you know, just understanding relationships in general. So it, it does start a little bit sooner, actually. Um, there is a sex ed task force, um, as you're aware, um, Jay? And the Office of School Wellness um, provides trainings on how to teach comprehensive health education inclusive of LGBT individuals. So they do have a specific curriculum geared towards training health educators on that. And, and as we know from the report, many of the teachers who are doing the sex ed in our schools don't receive the trainings. So I guess I, I think one key piece of this is just, and I think part of where this may have come from is just the fact that given the the public report we have on point that the teachers aren't getting the training that they need and we have teachers who are not trained to teach sex ed, teaching sex ed, that beyond that even where they are trained we're not even certain that they are also getting that type of education. Um, I think one, I guess along the lines of the GSA, so part of the legislation would be that there would be some sort of formalized training and that you would report on who has that training and in that way perhaps a student trying to find a pedagogical advisor would be able to look through and say, oh, there's, there's three teachers trained at my school. My school doesn't have a GSA. Why don't I reach out to one of those three teachers? So is that something you would support? And Yes, absolutely. We're, we're very supportive of reporting out on the training that we would provide. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, th we'd that's, like, yeah. Sorry. We'd like to report out on all of our training because I think GSA advisor training is, is one part, but we do a lot of training on terminology. Our, our Out for Safe Schools badges um, is a program that's over 20,000 staff members across the city wear these badges to show visible signs and support of being an LGBT ally. Um, I think, Councilmember Kalos, you may need one of these. Do you have a Out for Safe Schools? I will make sure that you get some for your office, too, so that you have them on hand for your staff. It's something that started in the DOE and actually expanded, not just to the DOE now, but other city agencies are also borrowing this program so that young people across the city can see that badge and say, that's somebody I can go and talk to. Uh, would you send it to all of my colleagues to wear at the graduation speeches or other school visits we happen to do? You can have as many as you want. That would be great. I thank you. That's my first round of questions. I'd like to turn it back to the chair and my colleagues. Thank you very much. And uh, you'll yeah. wear the badges, right? <laughs> thank you very much. And the badges are really important. I left mine home. I thought I had hung it on my doorknob and in my legislative office, but didn't. Um, uh, can you explain a little bit to me what's going on in District Two? 
uh, with, uh, with the work that um, Superintendent Bonnie LeBoy has done. What is her objective and uh, what is she looking at uh, make happen? So I first met the students in District 2 actually on the same day that Councilmember Kalos uh, came and talked to the young people. Um, and they were genuinely just curious, inquisitive young people who wanted to learn more. Um, and throughout the day, I saw that it was more than that. Those kids were citing Supreme Court case law. They had been researched. I mean, I was blown away. I taught high school English, and these kids blew me away at, at the middle school level. So I, I think at first, just kudos to the kids that I see here today, the young people who have led this charge. I'm just so appreciative of their leadership. I think what happened was Bonnie created a space, Superintendent LeBoy created a space for young people to assert their voice and their leadership. And from the young people came the interest and passion around GSAs, and she has fostered that amongst them. I think that's what we expect from all of our superintendents from all of our schools. Okay, very good. Um, and I, I want to give the kids, the students, I should say, from uh, District 2 an opportunity to speak. Um, but just I want to get this in, and then we have a question from Councilmember Margaret Chin as well. Um, and I know that we've had some discussions about this also, but um, in terms of training, I think it's really important also that we train the principals so that the principals know that this is coming from Central and that they feel secure that the administration will be there to support them as well. So uh, I know um, we have principal representation. John Connie is here today. And I want to make sure that that is, is on the record as well. Council Member Chin. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that also guidance counselors are very important um, so that the kids can go to them and, and get support. And my question was in terms of parent involvement. Um, are parents encouraged um, to get involved in helping support GSA? I mean, that's one of the, the funding. Uh, a lot of parents raise money to support different programs in the school. So that might be a way of really getting uh, parent involvement and supporting this program, and they can also you know, help raise some resources for that. So I think the really great thing that happened when I first started as the LGBT liaison was I call it the, the tour of parent coordinators. And I went borough to borough and I met with every parent coordinator that works in the New York City Department of Ed, told them that there's an LGBT liaison. And from there, I generally, I, I say drummed up business um, because it was parent coordinators wanting to find out how they can support their parents. The clubs that exist are student run, student led, and for the young people. What we've seen, though, a lot of times is that SLTs, uh, school leadership teams, PTAs, take on LGBT issues or causes. Um, so I know that LaGuardia High School for Performing Arts actually has a parent group for parents of LGBT young people that is meeting regularly to share support and resources and advocate for school-based policies and practices. There was even a school in Councilmember Drum's district he spoke about, Principal Zirin's school, they wanted to start a GSA, but they were really concerned about what parents might think um, and how to combat parents who maybe didn't want their kid to go. I went and I actually did a PTA meeting for them. So we're on the ground kind of helping to solve issues as they come up and support parents of LGBT young people, but also parents who are LGBT. We want to make sure that our DOE schools are safe and affirming for all types of families, um, including LGBT families, both on the children's aspect, but also LGBT parents. Thank you. Okay, hey, with that, I think we're going to stop here and we're going to invite the students to come up and to speak. So thank you again for all the hard work that you're doing. I really am very, very appreciative and you're making a huge difference in students' lives. So I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. All right, with that, we're going to bring up the following students. Clayton Saliga from the Manhattan Student Leadership Council. Great. Thank you so much, Gary. Benjamin. It's a little small. Zakowskis, if I'm not yeah, mispronouncing it, sorry. Um, Valerie Franchitti. Um, Katarina Kaur. Ty Cutler. And also the, uh, their teacher, Alejandro Ferrigua.
and also to mention that Katerina was one of the students who testified last year as well. And, um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand uh, to swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, very good. Who would like to start? Okay, very good. And just identify yourself so we know. There you go. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Dorm, Drum, community members. My name is Alejandro Forigua. I am the eighth grade Spanish teacher and the GSA advisor at M114 Eastside Middle School. It is with great pride that I come before you today. Five years ago, during my first year of teaching, I started a GSA in our school. During one of my classes, while working on a likes and dislikes project, a student wrote, me gustan las chicas y los chicos. That is Spanish for, I like boys and girls. To protect his privacy, I'll refer to him as John. John had been struggling to find his place in our school. I remember, I remember both teachers and administrators expressing their concern for his well-being. He wasn't shy about expressing feelings of anger, sadness, and frustration about school and his life at home. At school, we tried to come up with plans to support him and his family, but we still couldn't get through to him. After seeing that he wrote what he wrote in my class, I set up a meeting with my principal and suggested we start at GSA. He jumped at the idea with excitement and offered his full support. We decided that being the GSA advisor would be my administrative duty as a teacher. I made an announcement asking my classmates for my, I'm sorry, my classes for volunteers to start this project. To my surprise, John volunteered to be one of them. We printed posters, worked on a logo to represent us stopped by classes to invite students to join, and went, over, went to other schools to get guidance on starting a GSA. Before our first meeting, we were both nervous and excited. We had a great turnout. There were 20 students, and a few teachers stopped by to show their support. The kids had a great time. A few of them were very eager to ask questions and start conversations regarding gender identity and sexual orientation. Some others seemed to already have experience with these topics, since one seventh grader said at the beginning of the meeting, I think we should share our preferred pronouns as we introduce ourselves. By the end of the meeting, we all felt very accomplished, especially John. As the weeks went by, John's change was noticeable. He started showing a lot of interest in the GSA meetings and activities, taking on a leadership role and helping out as much as possible. I should tell you that at the time John identified as a girl. In one of our meetings, he came out as a lesbian. And by the end of the year, he asked us to refer to him as a boy. Having a GSA allowed him to question his identity in a safe and supportive environment where he was able to understand his own self. I have witnessed many success stories like this one over the past five years that filled me with pride and joy. Last year, a student returned after graduating to express his gratitude to me and the GSA members. Even though he never came to the meetings, he was happy the club existed. He vividly remembered Ally Week, a GSA event to encourage everyone to come out as allies to the, of the LGBTQ plus community. During that week, we stopped by every classroom asking for volunteers to take their picture, holding a sign with a message of allyship. The response was overwhelming. The majority of kids in every class wanted to be part of this event. We displayed posters of their pictures and messages throughout the school, and they stayed up there the whole year. In the words of parents, teachers, and students, this was an event that allowed everyone to be included and promoted a welcoming environment for all. 
And in the words of this particular student, it gave him the courage to come out. When I talk to other adults about the GSA, they always ask me, can you imagine if we had had that growing up? As a gay kid growing up in Colombia in an all-male military school, I can tell you it would have made been, it would have made, <laughs> it would have been much less painful. But to see the effort, commitment, and passion which these students are working to make sure every child feels safe at school gives me hope that my students will have a much better experience than previous generations. So, what is it about a GSA that has this great impact in schools? In my experience, it allows students to be a part of a good cause, of something big. We learn to welcome and appreciate each other's uniqueness. We help those in need, we make new friends, we find ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farigua, and uh, thank you for your courage and your commitment as a teacher to your students. What I'm most impressed with in your testimony is that you met your students' needs, that you were not afraid, as I've heard oftentimes, those who have turned down students who asked to have a GSA in their schools. And so I really want to acknowledge your courage in doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. Hi. Uh, my name is Ty Cutler. I'm a sophomore at the Brooklyn Technical High School. And um, I was part of the District 2 Student Council in eighth grade, uh, which is now the Manhattan Student Council. And um, in middle school, I experienced firsthand the impact a GSA can have um, on the students of a school. Um, in sixth and seventh grade, my middle school, two, uh, IS-276, didn't have a GSA. We were... Um, and, and I, my friends would come to me and express their feelings that they, they didn't actually feel that there was a teacher in the school that they could go to to, to trust and uh, to talk to about their feelings. Um, and in eighth grade, I, uh, me and my friend went to uh, my social studies teacher, who was uh, openly lesbian. And, and we expressed our thoughts that we should have a GSA in our school. And... And she, she told me that she had been waiting her entire career at the school for a student to come up to her and express her thoughts that we should have a GSA. Um, and and as, soon as, I, as, as soon as we opened the doors to the GSA, which, which met weekly, I, I saw a change. I saw my friends who were expressing their thoughts that they couldn't come to a place to talk to. They, they came to the GSA, and they were talking about the feelings that they only express to me and my inner circle of friends. And, and I saw the impact that this could have on students and how, and how it really changed uh, the, the idea that all of a sudden all these students, straight, gay, transgender, could come out and, and say whatever they wanted, not, not even necessarily um, focused on gender, sexuality, and things like that, just their personal feelings and... Um, even some of whom were being bullied at the time were able to talk about it and uh, got their problem solved. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. I want to go through the students, and then we'll come back and, and have some questions and comments for everybody, okay? Next, please. City Council members and staff. In the past, members of the LGBTQ plus community were shamed and closeted for their sexual orientation. People that were LGBTQ plus were ostracized by laws created by our all-accepting country. Today, we are striving to be a society where we celebrate our differences and understand that we cannot control the way that others think and feel, and that is a good thing. Every student hopes to go to a school where there will be an environment that welcomes them and makes them feel safe. Complete absolute acceptance is a goal that we may never achieve. But in order for students to have a sense of security, it is essential to create a place where any student, regardless of their race, gender, sex, religion, and sexual orientation, can go and feel safe. To improve the situation, it is essential to acknowledge the problem. And this problem is quite serious for many LGBTQ plus students. According to the GLSEN 2015 National School Climate Survey, LGBTQ students have a high rate of being harassed or assaulted for various identity-based issues, including sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender. These three issues had the highest rate of harassment and assault, which further shows how necessary it is to have a safe space for LGBTQ students. 
The survey also revealed that LGBTQ students heard anti-LGBT remarks in their schools. It is important to both protect vulnerable students and educate all students on appropriate uses of words and general inclusive education. The study states the majority of LGBTQ students in New York regularly heard anti-LGBT remarks, and most LGBTQ students in New York had been victimized at school. GSAs will not stop all bullying and harassment in all New York City schools. But anyone that has been bullied knows that you need a place or a person that you can go to and feel safe with. A GSA is where allies and LGBTQ plus students can gather to share stories and work on joint projects. It is a safe space and a welcoming environment where any student can flourish without being worried of being made fun of, harassed, or assaulted. It states in the GLSEN 2015 National School Climate Survey that findings demonstrate that New York City schools were not safe for most lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ secondary school students. This is something that desperately needs to change, and GSAs can help us move that forward. We cannot send children to school knowing that they do not feel safe. This change needs to happen as soon as possible, and this begins with encouraging schools to create a gender and sexuality alliance in every middle and high school in New York City. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Next, please. And also, I'm sorry, I meant to ask you, would you state your name for the record? I don't believe you stated your name. Katerina Kaur. Thank you, Katerina. Next, please. And your name also. Uh, I am Clay Saliga, currently a freshman at the High School for Math, Science, and Engineering at City College. And before I begin, I'd, I'd just like to thank you all for allowing me to testify before you today. As you know, my name is Clay Saliga, and I am here on behalf of the Manhattan Student Leadership Council. As you all know, we are a student group dedicated to improving our city and schools through action. In particular, for the past two years, we have campaigned for the widespread adoption of gender sexuality alliances in public middle schools. Gender sexuality alliances, as a refresher, are student organizations meant to establish a strong school community of LGBT students and their allies. These GSAs provide support for LGBT students in need, inform non-LGBT students about issues regarding gender and sexuality, and begin important and profound discussions about the world we live in. Now, I'd like to... I would like to share some statistics with you all. Reliable estimates indicate that between 4 and 10 percent of the population is gay, which means that in a public school system of more than 1 million, like ours here in New York City, there are at least 400,000 to, to 100,000 gay students. A study by the student rights group Glesson found that in schools with a GSA, there was an over 10 percent decrease in students who felt unsafe about their sexual orientation and or gender expression. The study also showed a significant decrease in students who skipped school because they felt unsafe about their sexuality. LGBT bullying is also the second most common type of bullying in schools and still remains criminally unaddressed in our school system's discipline policies. LGBT students also have a greater risk of depression and many types of violence compared to their straight and cisgender peers. Our GSAs aim to fix many of these deeply rooted problems that affect LGBT students every day. Currently, thanks to our efforts and the help of Superintendent LeBoy and Principal Getz, every school in District 2 is required to have a GSA. However, we at the Manhattan Student Leadership Council do not want to stop there. That is why we are here today. We have met with activist organizations such as GLSEN, received signatures from many UFT chapter chairs, and have also received widespread support for our efforts. As education chairs, you all have great respect and pride for our city's school system. But we come seeking a different kind of pride, respect for the LGBT community that struggles every day to learn and achieve academic excellence in the greatest city in the world. We implore you to vote yes, not just to improve our schools, but to improve the lives of the students all across the city. And for a minute, if you'd allow, I'd just like to go off record to tell a story. In 2016... If, if you say off record, um, the, the sorry, hearing is recorded. Sorry, off record, off script. Off the, off, okay, that's fine, because the hearing's recorded. I just want you to know that. My mistake. Okay. In 2016, as you all know, we had a, a pretty groundbreaking election. And during that time, I had a, a really good friend of mine. And the day... Don't worry about that either. And the day after election day, we had all come into school, and many of us were uh, very upset about the results. And our principal had 
they sort of came, came to our room during Humanities and brought cupcakes, and we thought, now why is she bringing cupcakes? And then he came up to the front of the class on the day after Election Day and told us that he, formerly she, was transgender. And the reaction among my peers was just incredible. We were asking questions for a whole hour of this period where we were supposed to be learning about, I think it was, uh, civil rights. We just had an hour of questions and there was so much overwhelming support for his decision and for him. And eventually our school went on to establish a GSA. And later at the end of the year, he came up to me and said, thank you so much for starting this. Thanks to the Manhattan Leadership Council for starting this because every Wednesday at 11 o'clock has been my favorite day and my favorite time at school for the past year. Thank you. Who admitted that they were transgender? I'm sorry? Who, who, who said they were transgender? Um, the student? Yes. A student in your, in your class? Yes, uh, a friend of mine. Wow, that's really amazing. Uh, and um, it, that's a very, um, really moving, moving story, I have to tell you. Um, you know, I used to be a teacher before I got elected to the city council. And I used to say, this, the kids, they know best, you know? And uh, I came out as an openly gay teacher in 1992, well, like 25 years ago. And all the kids, when, on the day when I, when I came out, uh, they were all very supportive of me, and I'll never forget it, so. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Drum and committee members. My name is Benjamin Zakoskis, and I'm an eighth grader at the Eastside Middle School. I came here because I want to tell you about my experience in the GSA. It is a really nice and safe place where you can be yourself, where kids can come out and are comfortable doing so without feeling attacked physically or emotionally. We meet every Wednesday during lunch, and you can get to know many friendly people, students that might want to create change and will be inclusive to anyone who wants to help. I started at ESMS a year late in seventh grade. In my former school, there was a lot of discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community, and many kids used the word gay as an insult. Before coming to ESMS, I had no idea what a GSA was. I first joined the GSA in November 2016 when my Spanish teacher, who runs the GSA, worked on a school-wide event with the GSA members. I asked him about it, and he said it was called Ally Week. This is a week used to celebrate LGBTQ plus pride and show our support for diversity. I decided to reach out to Senor Forigua, my Spanish teacher, and asked him what motivated him to start a GSA, not knowing completely what it was. He told me that as a kid, he grew up in an environment that wasn't accepting towards him for being gay. He says that now being a teacher, it was really important for him to make sure his students never felt that way. He said that I should join the GSA and would learn all about it there. I first started attending the GSA meetings because I didn't have much to do during the lunchtime. Then I realized how important this space was for our school. So students need a place where they can freely express themselves around people they trust. If every middle school and high school had that, students would feel a lot safer. Before joining the GSA, lunch wasn't all that fun and I didn't have much to do. I love the GSA because it spices up my lunch. For example, I work on big projects knowing that I'm helping people out. Also, I get to do things I like to do, such as practicing my Spanish, which I really, really enjoy. One of our most successful events is when we support the AIDS Walk New York. Last year, we were able to fundraise more than 9,000 to the cause. All students had the opportunity to volunteer and work towards the goal. In the GSA, I have the opportunity to help out in the community. This work is extremely important for students in need because they might need our help and not be as fortunate as we are, so it's our job to help them. The GSA can also teach students that everyone sh should be treated 
with respect because we are all humans. Overall, a GSA in every middle and high school can make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you also. Next, please. Oh, here. Oh, did you say you said your name, right? Yes. Okay, good. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Valerie Franchetti, and I am an eighth grade student at Eastside Middle School, and I am a proud member of my school's GSA. I'm here in front of you today to tell you about my experience over the past three years in this club. I first joined our GSA in the sixth grade. The sixth grade was a difficult year for me. I was 11 years old in a new school, and I didn't know where I fit in. I was overwhelmingly nervous and uncomfortable. The whole experience was generally unpleasant. But the GSA was always a place where I could find comfort in, especially in such a stressful year. I remember my first GSA meeting. I met a girl in my school's cafeteria, and she told me about the club, and told me that I should show up. And she described the GSA as such a wonderful community. And I thought to myself, why not? So the following Thursday, I decided to go. I vividly remember walking up the four flights of stairs, each flight my heartbeat getting faster and faster. And when I finally reached the third floor, it felt like my heart just might jump, jump out of my chest. I didn't know what I was going to see. I didn't know what to expect. Everything was so new and foreign. And I finally walked into the classroom, and this wave of relief crashed over me as I saw a group of smiling, happy faces looking up at me. And someone pulled up a chair, people introduced themselves and included me in the conversation the whole time. Even though I didn't know anyone too well yet, it felt as if I had stumbled upon a family. That's what the GSA turned into for me, to type of family. And this is now my third year in the GSA, and I've grown tremendously throughout this time. The GSA has provided me with a stable platform, a helpful community, so I had the ability to figure out a lot of things. Things that I don't think I could have figured out if the GSA wasn't there. There's something special about having a place to go. There's something about having a community there. Somewhere where you can focus on something besides life's issues and somewhere you can go if you feel out of place. Somewhere where, no matter who you are, you feel part of the family. And that is, for me, the main goal of the GSA, to accept anyone who walks in through the door and give them a place to be, give them a family. This type of community is so difficult to find in such a hostile world. You know, I was lucky enough to find people who understood what I was going through. It's lonely, trying to figure yourself out, coming to terms with things about yourself that you may hate or detest, and I had people to help me through all of this, and still I felt so isolated by all of the questions in my mind. And I can't imagine what it must be like to not have a shoulder to lean on and to be truly alone in these questions. That type of solitude would drive me and most others insane. And yet there are people out there in this very city that deal with that every day, and it hurts me even to think about how painful that must be. And I truly hope that one day, we can make it so that if people need a community, if people need a helping hand or a listening ear, they can find one as easily as I did. Thank you. Thank you very much. Boy, all of your testimony is just very, very moving, very emotional for me to hear the stories, but also to hear the hope in your voices and, and, and to acknowledge the strength that you have to have done the things that you've done and, 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 and to have gotten us here in the New York City Council to this point where we're going to pass this law and this resolution very, very soon, I hope. I hope by the end of, of this year this will be done uh, because we think it's very important and especially because it was student initiated. I guess my question, I mean, I have about five or six here, but I know you guys also have to leave. But I guess the biggest question I have here is what would happen if you didn't have a GSA in your school? What might happen to students if you didn't have it, especially LGBT students? Well, I, I think... Um, Just turn on that mic to the red light. Oh, yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, I think a, a big problem with m 
many students, especially in middle school, is that this is the, these are the three years of your life where you're going through the most development and, and you're growing the most. And, and in those years, with, without a support community around you, even, even if, you're, if your own group of friends can, can be a support group, but one of the most important things uh, is, is having a place to go, whether, whether it's a guidance counselor or especially a GSA. Without that, you, you can bottle up a lot of things that, that really need to be expressed, especially as you're developing. Um, so, so not being able to express those can, can create a lot of internal torment in your body. And, and we've seen it in the, the worst scenarios where students end up killing themselves because of this inner torment without having a place to express this. I, um, I, I, I said only one question, but then I, I, another one has is, is, is hit me. I, and, and one of your testimonies, I think um, it was you in the middle, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Um, that you said um, it was the second highest uh, incidence of bullying was anti-gay or anti-LGBT bullying. Um, what was the first? The first, I believe, was bullying based on perceived uh, weight or other physical characteristics. So that's pretty incredible. So, and then. Do you fit them all into the same category? Do you believe that it's all um, similar uh, in its root? You're referring to the the sort of idea of bullying one because students will find oftentimes find uh, some reason to bully other students. And is is anti LGBT bullying different than um, those who are discriminated because of they might be, of their weight? Absolutely, it's different. I, I think they're all debilitating to the person who is on the receiving end of the bullying, but you can't call them all the same. There's a real difference between, you know, discriminating against someone because of their sexuality or their race or their gender or v versus, you know, discriminating against someone because of their weight or physical appearance. So you actually hit the nail on the head with that answer for me in my mind because this was not planned. But one of the reasons, the main reasons why I as chair of the Education Committee have held now three hearings on LGBT youth is because sometimes in the discussion about bullying, some folks in education in particular are afraid to say lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. And I don't think that if we don't say those words, then I think the assumption oftentimes is, is that kids can still bully other kids uh, on that basis. I think teachers are, are more comfortable talking about discrimination based on clothing, based on um, uh, weight or whatever, but oftentimes they don't have um, the ability to be able to deal with the LGBT issue, and I think that's why GSAs are so vitally important. Councilmember, did you want to add anything? I again want to thank our chair for being such a strong leader on this and making great points that I wanted to make too. Uh, I just want to first just thank all of you. Uh, there are very few New Yorkers who have done what you are doing, uh, and uh, as a person who has asked many people to come and testify. Uh, what you're doing is absolutely amazing. Your testimony is some of the best I've ever heard, and that's versus uh, attorneys and lobbyists and, 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 and you name it, and people who get paid to do this for a living. So I just want to thank you for making your voices uh, heard. So um, I, I know in particular that the Eastside Middle School students are very forceful with me that you said you wanted a budget allocation. I, I, if you can tell me how much the budget you believe each GSA should have and uh, why having funding for your GSA is so important. And then DOE mentioned, well, if they fund one, they would have to fund others. Is there a reason why GSAs in particular should have funding versus others? Well, I believe that GSA should have funding because for a GSA, it would be desirable to have certain materials, including like materials so that you can fundraise, so that you can spread awareness throughout the school. You need 
funding in order to do a lot of things that GSAs want to do so that they can spread awareness throughout schools and other places in comparison to other clubs that are within themselves. A GSA isn't just within itself. It's part of its uh, purpose is to spread awareness along with supporting all the people in the group. So in order to do that, they, it's, like it's, hopefully they would be able to have funding. And just uh, across the board, have you had a sex ed class in middle school? What grade was it in and did it include any education relating to sexual orientation or gender identity? And you can start across and. Um, actually, in sex education in general, it's kind of a tricky subject just because a lot of people don't feel comfortable with it. Um, but we have indeed had a, uh, we do have sex ed available in Eastside Middle School. I do not believe that we have included things about LGBTQ people within that. And that's something that does concern me, just because in a school that is so accepting, in a school that has all of these things, you know, we have to continue to grow and continue to do those things. and so. Having a GSA there, we can definitely try to work with that program and try to do that, which I think would actually be a very good idea. And is everyone an Eastside Middle School student who's here? No. Okay, for the other schools, if you can share your school, and same question. So um, where I went to middle school at the Salk School of Science, uh, we had a sex, uh, a sex education program in eighth grade. We were lucky enough to have NYU med students come in to teach the program rather than our teachers, which I think overall was generally a much better and more comfortable experience with the subject. But we did not have any discussion about sexual orientation, gender, etc. And um, for me, I went to IS-276. And um, there, well, we had sex education in eighth grade as well. It was taught by the gym teacher. And um, we, had, we had no formal education on uh, the LGBT community at all. Uh, and I think if you actually wanted any sort of education on that, uh, a lot of teachers would, would talk about it. For example, my social studies teacher uh, would have in-class discussions about it. But uh, sex ed never touched upon the subject. Is that all the students at varying schools? Okay. And uh, did the GSAs provide a place for you to learn about gender or sexual orientation? And was it uh, students being resources for one another? Was it a, a uh, pedagogical advisor providing resources? H how did you get that education that you were seeking? Um, yeah, through the GSA, we got a lot of that information. My GSA was led by a learning specialist in seventh grade who also assisted our humanities teacher. And she had a bachelor's, I believe, in gender studies, which made her the prime candidate to lead the GSA. We also had experts come in from advocacy organizations to teach us, as well as a planned but I wasn't, either wasn't there to see it happen or it didn't come to pass. Lesson about gender and the brain from one of our science teachers. Um, I actually, I, I had a friend in middle school who had very little understanding of uh, the LGBT community, uh, didn't, didn't really understand gay relationships or how someone could change their gender. And so me and my friend group um, said, come to a GSA meeting. Today during lunch, we ha we're having a GSA meeting. Come in and, um, and we'll, we'll talk. And you can just listen in on the conversation. And after that, she never missed another GSA meeting. She came to every single one after that because she, she was enlightened to this totally new community that she had no idea existed. And, and she understood it so much clearer than, than before. 
And so uh, this one's for uh, Katarina. So we, we discussed a little bit of what now the entire world knows about. And so I think you and another student through this process brought this to your uh, principal. And so has a GSA in this conversation had an impact on the school and its plan for sexual education moving forward this fall? Well, I'm not at Eastside Middle anymore, unfortunately. But <laughs> from Last year in particular, um, during the GSA meetings, I addressed the students and I said, what are some of the issues that you would like to work on for our school? And uh, we ended up choosing three different leaders to work in different projects, and one of them was the sex ed curriculum. They've showed a lot of interest on this curriculum and they started doing research and gathering information. And I think some of the things that um, these students are wondering in terms of support for the GSAs is that when you talk about GSA advisors, you have Spanish teachers, you have guidance counselors, you have uh, the parent coordinators. So there's not a specific person who in every single GSA may have the training to lead these conversations. As you know, for teachers sometimes these conversations can be a little difficult. So. Uh, one of the things that we did was to start preparing, and it's a project that we are planning to continue this year uh, to address our school and to address the sex ed curriculum. So that's something that is ongoing in our school, absolutely. So, so yes, and I, I'm not sure if the person is testifying, but just following this conversation, Eastside Middle School will now be including gender and sexuality as part of their sex ed education this coming fall. And it came from the students and the PTA. Hearing that it was coming from the students was more responsive, and I guess, it's hard for me not to ask this question just for the uh, teacher. Do you feel that having tenure, which is a protection from being terminated for uh, any, re being terminated at will, gives you the protection that you need to uh, be a GSA advisor? Well, I've never really thought about that. I've never thought about- Great um, thing about tenure. <laughs> <laughs> well, tenure, you know, I think it's coming now, it's happening. Um, but for me, it's been all about opening up the space and giving uh, students a voice. And it's clearly been uh, really effective. I'm really happy with the empowerment that the students have nowadays. And you know, we're, I'm sitting here with them and the research they've done, the passion that they share towards these issues, and I'm more than confident that they'll, they'll make it work. I'll just be riding along the way to make sure they are on track that if they need questions or support, that I'm there for them. Uh, but really, it's them doing all the work. Uh, thank you. We're just discussing, uh, maybe it's a sign of the times how things are changing. But when I came out, the very first thing that I was asked by the news media uh, was whether or not I had tenure. And thank goodness I had tenure because my school board went after me big time. They came into my classroom, they forced investigations, they um, tried to harass me, they wrote newspaper articles to get me out of the school, and fortunately for me, I had tenure, so I'm always grateful for that. But um, yeah, I hope things are changing and that teachers don't have to really think about it. But it's a, uh, it's a, it's yeah. a good reason why teachers need tenure, I'll tell you that. Absolutely. When, when, when I started the GSA and when I came to the GSA to my principal, I got nothing but support. Mm -hmm. They actually, my principal and assistant principal at the time, they smiled. They said, yes, we've been looking and hoping that somebody would come with this idea to volunteer to be the advisor. So I've never felt that way. Maybe that's why I never thought about it, because I felt nothing but support. And I've been encouraged and I'm celebrated for this, not just by my um, principal and assistant principal, but also by my peers, parents, and students. That's really great news, yeah. Thank you. Well, I want to thank this panel very much. We do have other panelists who are going to speak as well, so I know you guys probably have to leave soon, but I really thank you. And this, this hearing will be taped, it will be filmed, and you'll be able to follow it uh, at a later date as well. So if you want to see the rest of the hearing, you can get it on the New York City Council website. Okay? Thank you all very much for coming thank you. in. And we're hoping it'll be syndicated by the Eastside Middle School uh, TV show that they do. Yes, okay, so we've, we um, were joined or have been joined by Council Member Steve Levin, Council Member Antonio Reynoso, and Council Member Edonis Rodriguez as well. Thank them for being here, thank you. Our next panel, Aisha Khan from Gail Brewer's office.
I'm sorry. Ephron. Ephron, I'm sorry. Um, Janella Hines from the United Federation of Teachers and Anthony Harmon from the United Federation of Teachers. Okay, let me um, ask you to raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. All right. Where should we start? I can start. All right. Uh, so my name is Aisha Irfan. I'm with the Office of the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Thank you, Chair Drum, for this opportunity to testify on Intro 1638 and Rezo 1442. Um, I'm going to skip over the summary of the bill and the rezo, but I'll jump to the second paragraph. As a city, we must educate over one million students. We have a, a responsibility to build and implement curricula and after-school activities that are culturally responsive and represent our students' social, cultural, and sexual identities. Gathering information on the current landscape of GSAs in public schools is a necessary first step in working to create welcoming and positive school culture. According to a recent study by Human Rights Watch, walk, like walking through a hailstorm, discrimination against LGBTQ youth in U.S. schools, LGBTQ identifying students across the country describe bullying as a prevalent issue. Students also relay that they felt unsure about who to turn to for support. It's my hope that as we get a better sense of which schools currently have GSAs, we can work directly with schools to develop support networks to ensure that our LGBTQ students feel affirmed, included, and safe. It is also imperative to acknowledge the Manhattan Leadership Council's role in making these bills a reality. Now more than ever, we need to be supporting our students' voices and creating pathways for our young people to get involved in the political process. These middle school students, under the leadership of Superintendent Bonnie LeBoy, Principal Getz, and school leaders in Community School District 2 have shown elected officials what is possible when we center young people's voices, experiences, and hopes for the future and work to make them a reality. All students in New York City would benefit from a program like the Manhattan Leadership Council, where school principals are equipping students with the necessary knowledge and skills to become active and engaged leaders in the democratic process. Clay, Selick, Katerina, Anaya, and Niall, who just spoke, I thank you for your testimony today. And to, to the rest of the Manhattan Leadership Council, I congratulate you on your efforts and look forward to working with you on the actualization of these efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, and please um, let the borough president know how much I appreciate her support, particularly on these issues, uh, not only as borough president, but when she was council member here with us as well. Thank you very, very much. Ms. Hines or Mr. Harmon? Good afternoon. I'm Anthony Harmon. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Anthony Harmon. I'm director for community and parent engagement with the United Federation of Teachers. And I'd like to start by saying thank you so very, very much to our, our council uh, for taking up, this uh, taking up this issue today. The United Federation of Teachers and its over 200,000 members who serve children of all genders and sexual orientations, again, would like to thank the Committee um, on Education and our Chair, Danny Drum, uh, for holding this hearing. Um, LGBTQ children discover often at an early age that they are different from the stereotypes and expectations that they encounter everywhere from movies to televisions and even in their own families. Many LGBT students um, cannot even rely on family members to understand the disproportionate numbers um, and the disproportionate numbers facing verbal and physical abuse or abandonment. The UFT, including our many LGBTQ members, is committed to the safety and civil rights of all of our students and teachers. We are proud to have worked with the Department of Education and Council Member Drum and many others with the Department of Education, um, both past and present, on issues of L that affect our LGBTQ students. Our work includes training thousands of U of T members 
and the Dignity for All Students Act around specific needs of transgender uh, and gender non-performing students. What's more, our Positive Learning Collaborative, a joint initiative with the Department of Education, has helped to provide students, uh, teachers and staff with intensive training to help students deal with feelings of frustrations, anger, rejection, and depression. And our Brave Anti-Bullying Program includes a student and parent hotline, parent workshops, and conferences, all with express goals to responding to and presenting bullying including how to talk to your children about bullying and how to support affected children. Critically, teachers work with students to create gender and sexuality, alli sexuality, sexuality alliances and gay-straight alliances, both called GSAs, uh, such as the one in Staten Island in New Dorp High School, by two teachers and a paraprofessional. We must continue to work diligently with our whole school to create a safe space for all of our students and for all of our students. Going forward, the U of T's Pride Committee um, will be a major vehicle to bring about more positive change for our LGBTQ students and teachers. Though recently dormant, the committee has had a notable history. At the height of the AIDS crisis, it established a hotline with, which provided hundreds of members with counseling and other assistance. The Pride Committee was rekindled in the wake of the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida in 2016. That tra tragedy, the deadliest mass shooting in a sing by a single shooter, and the deadliest act of violence against LGBTQ people in modern U.S. history galvanized our members and redoubled our resolve to fight for the LGBTQ community, community inside and outside our schools. Thank you for your time. My name is Janella Hines, and I'm Vice President of Academic High Schools for the United Federation of Teachers. And as my colleague Anthony shared, the United Federation of Teachers has a very proud history in advocating for and supporting LGBTQ students and educators, the members of our union. I am proud this afternoon to um, speak after those brilliant middle and high school students that spoke and pre presented testimony this afternoon. They are sharing an experience that many don't recognize or understand um, what it's like to be a teenager in middle school or high school right now who's developing his or her identity in a world that doesn't really respect individuality, um, adolescence, and their growth as young people. In secondary school, whether middle or high, this is a time of exposure, exploration, and expansion for adolescents. The middle and high school experiences should present students with the opportunity to ask questions and engage in conversations with other students and supportive adults about academic subjects, current events, and extracurricular opportunities. It is also a time when students are building relationships, platonic and romantic, with each other. And GSAs provide a safe space for LGBTQ students and cisgender students to discuss gender identity and sexuality in a space that is supportive and safe. And in our testimony, we've talked about the Earth School, an elementary school in the East Village where teachers help students understand about rights movements, including LGBTQ rights, through an inquiry-based approach. Could also talk about the Harvey Milk High School, a transfer high school, the country's first public high school dedicated to gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or questioning students. Students who may have had challenges in previous schools but have found a community where they are free to be themselves and to continue to learn and accumulate credits as they move towards graduation in a space where they are not bullied, in a space where they are not pushed to be something other than they're not, they are able to grow as individuals. And as Anthony mentioned, New Dorp High School has a GSA where LGBTQ students as well as students who are allies, cisgender students are working together to ask questions, to engage with each other and to build relationships. The UFT is proud to stand with the City Council and to support these measures that are being discussed today, and we thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harmon and, and Ms. Hines as well. Um, as a former uh, UFT, proud UFT chapter leader, 
and an out-gay teacher starting in 1992. Uh, I uh, am very deeply grateful to the United Federation of Teachers for the support that they gave me. They were my GSA in those days because I had nobody, you know, uh, except for the teachers and uh, the union. Uh, and so I'm always very grateful to the union. I'm grateful to the union as well for your BRAVE program. And I think that's an also uh, a very large contribution. Uh, now, that being said, I still do hear stories about teachers who are fearful um, of coming out. And uh, that is something that I'd like to work with you more on, is how can we facilitate the coming out process for teachers so that they um, can serve as role models to our students in the schools. And I, I don't know if you have any ideas on that, but certainly if you don't now, it's something I'd love to sit down and talk with both of you about. I think we welcome the opportunity to engage in that conversation. Um, as educators, we know that uh, our honesty and our integrity as individuals it builds our strength as educators. And those educators who don't feel comfortable enough living in their truth need the strength and the support in order to do that. So we would be happy to speak with you about that. that. That's great. And I just one suggestion also while Jared Fox is still here. Um, one of the uh, main vehicles of communication that was important to me as a UFT member was um, the spring conference. And I'm wondering if we couldn't think to do a workshop at the spring conference on uh, LGBT issues in the school. I just want to throw that suggestion out there and see if we couldn't work on something like that as well. I think that's an excellent idea. And as a member of the committee, that, um, the UFT committee for the spring conference, I'd like to take that back and uh, see if we can actually make that happen. I think people would be very interested. As a matter of fact, what I'm getting from teachers right now is that they want to go ahead with this stuff. What they need are some materials and they need the okay. And I um, have been stressing with the Department of Education that, and, and I said it in my opening speech, that um, you know, I'm a deep believer in, in, in change happening from the grassroots up, but in this case, and this is an exception, it has to also start from the top down to say, that the Department of Education, the de Blasio administration, and the city of New York will be there for these teachers should they decide to come out or work on this, this material. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you do in our schools. Thank and you. I know Councilmember Rodriguez has some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. As a former uh, chapter leader that I was at uh, Luperon High School, school that I also hope to be a co-founder, and as a teacher for 13 years, I can tell you that we lived, especially during those years that I was teaching up to 2009, so many experiences where students who were discriminated because of their sexual orientation, they didn't have a space to talk. They didn't have the support. And one of my recommendations is about not only to be sure that we stop any bullying for any members of the GBTQ community, but also to work with the parents. Because one experience that I have with a great student, she was a sect in LaGuardia, but she couldn't deal with the pressure because the family, they were so conservative that the mother thought that she had a different sex preference than her. And the whole story for her mother was about if it's true that you're lesbian, I will jump from the top of my building. So that was in the 2000s, but that's not far from where we are in many communities that are so conservative. So I think it is important also to expand the programming that we already have or working with the parents, because they are the first one that they should know that it is the right of any child to choose who they are. And I know that, I believe that the UFT you will be having the conference for the ELS, the English language learner. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. It is important also to, if you don't have it by any chance, <coughs> if it is, great, but if you don't, we need also to work with that population. <coughs> because especially many of the ELS students, that they are, only, they are not only Latinos, they are students that they come from the former Soviet Union. They also come from Asia. They come from Africa and from the Caribbean. Many of them, they also immigrate from places 
that there's no any sensibility or any support for the GLBTQ community. So for me as a father of two daughters, that I'm raising them together with my wife, knowing that their generation should be a generation that we should celebrate who we are, regardless of the sex preference, the color of our skin. It is so important, again, to work not only among the students in the classroom, but also with their parents. Because if those students from the LGBTQ community get the support from the teacher and the parents, then they can resist any bullying that they can be dealing with. Of course, we need to put everything in place to stop any bullying, to have consequences for those cases. But I think my encouraging is to see, you know, what are we doing when you think about, you know, the LGBTQ community and the support they've been getting right now, what are we doing with their parents? We do have um, the United Federation of Teachers does work with parents and community on a regular basis. In all five of our boroughs, we have parent and community liaisons who support um, parents in bridging the gap that exists between the schools and our communities. And so I thank you for that recommendation, and we will take that back and engage in some conversations about that. I would like to encourage you know, to really pay attention. Because let's say I was raised in a family, very traditional. It, it, I was born and raised, coming at the age of 18. I was so lucky as a recent immigrant to be surrounded with people from the beginning. They told me that it is important to celebrate the diversity that everyone brings. However, that was not the reality of my parents, born and raised at the beginning of the 20th century when they didn't know about everyone being equal and being so influenced by many of our religion that is so conservative. So I think it's so important, you know, to pay attention, to establish good programming, to speak to the parents so that they don't wait to hear from a third person that my son and daughter has a preference when it comes to the sexual orientation different from the one that I have, but instead to celebrate who we are. So it's only, you know, a suggestion for us to look at that, at that area. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, yep, Councilman Kalos. Uh, so uh, just to, uh, I think one of the, just for my, my colleague, Council Member Adonis Rodriguez, I think one of the concerns we spoke about, even with the students, which was one of the biggest concerns, was making sure that we uh, got training for the uh, pedagogical advisors to make sure that there was a uh, safe space so that no child in the city of New York ends up in a situation where uh, they aren't ready to have that conversation with their family and where they may not have a family that's supportive. So I think uh, one thing that I hope to gain from today's testimony is how to avoid the situation where, uh, and I think we, we talked about it at length as we were working on this as we were moving forward with GSAs of just a situation where we knew that the students would have protection in terms of their pedagogical advisor but making sure that kids respected one another's privacy and uh, right to keep their truths to themselves and those they choose to share with. So, um, I'm, I'm proud to be a one of co-sponsors yeah. on what we're doing today. So as a council member that had been, you know, signing and supporting all initiatives that is important for the LGBTQ community. Not only am I putting my name where we are today, but we will continue working, especially with Dennis, that not only bring his own experience on being a leader for the LGBTQ community, but also the committee that he chair. That's what we are touching 1,200,000 students. They are the ones who are our guarantee that we are training that generation, again, to celebrate, understand, and respect everyone's civil rights. So for me, it is an honor to be, you know, a sponsor of what we're doing today, but also highlighting the importance also to include the parents as we are expanding the support for the LGBTQ community. And just to add to that as well, you know, um, I think it's important that uh, we talk to the parents and we also talk about the intersectionality 
of race and sexual orientation and all of the other uh, issues. Um, and, and, and that's a way to relate to parents as well on this particular topic. So, so, so just to get to the, the questions I had, uh, uh, first uh, uh, to Olin, thank, thank you. Uh, please give my regards to Glenda and Shuju. We were hoping to have Shuju back. She had been my committee counsel at one point, and we're grateful to have this, this center. Um, in terms of it, uh, I think it's a, a tremendous resource to what extent can we work to make sure that all the kids at GSAs and, and the schools know about the center, the resources, and that there are not only the center in Manhattan, but there are others in, throughout the five. How many boroughs are we up to? Uh, five. We're up to five? Four. For what? For, for LGBT centers. Oh, no. Um, that's a good question. Sort of five. Yeah, sort, sort of, of five. five. No, because some of them are health centers versus community centers, but I'll say five. How, how, do, we, how do we connect folks? Oh, I'm sorry. I stepped out, so no worries. Uh, for, for UFT, uh, we had a, uh, a, a teacher feel fairly comfortable, fairly supported. Uh, what are you seeing on the ground? It's a very large city. It's fairly diverse. You have places that are incredibly progressive and liberal. There are other places that are, are less so. Uh, what are our teachers seeing on the ground in terms of their comfort and being able to help students start a GSA? Are we seeing uh, retaliation from PTAs? Are we seeing retaliation from principals? Are, what does it look like on the ground and what types of work is UFT trying to do? Is, is Danny's story a story from 25 years ago or could we open up the Daily News or the New York Post, unfortunately, to see that story today? I think that the experiences of educators, um, it, there's, there's a wide range that we would see across the city. Um, and as we spoke earlier with Council Member Drome, it, there is a need for more support, more conversation about how someone can be in the professional space and still live in his or her truth, right? Um, but that being said, we have, as a union, spent a lot of time thinking about how to best support our members, whether it's through our Pride Committee or ensuring that our Digni Dignity for All Students Act training that we are offering specifically to newer educators um, incorporates these conversations about respect, about um, understanding how students may express themselves in ways that are different from how people have in the past. Um, I think we, we do have a strong and solid record on support for LGBTQ students. We recently passed a resolution at our delegate assembly where we talked about expanding what the DOE offers around healthy relationships and sexual education. We do want to see increased professional learning opportunities for educators, whether that's during the school day or on weekends. Um, but we, we need space for, for educators to rethink how we understand sexuality and gender and sexual orientation. We need space to ask these questions and to challenge each other and to think about how all of this has an impact on who we are in front of students as educators. Um, and I think our professional learning time provides those opportunities for us. So what we learned today during the hearing is that uh, the Department of Education is looking to put together some sort of official GSA training that if we pass this, they would then do it. So what is the opportunity between UFT and DOE to develop that from scratch, as it seems, or at least from last year's initial pilot uh, to, to make sure that the teachers have the support that they need, that they get compensated for that training, and that we have something that we can rely upon and then grow from? Um, well, certainly through our teacher center, we ensure that the quality of our professional learning opportunities remains high and um, our relationships with the Department of Education allow us to request that we are involved in these conversations around GSAs and around sexuality and around professional learning covering those issues. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, just before I let you go, too, I just want to say that um, um, 
one of the recipients of the John Dewey Award at the United Federation of Teachers Spring Conference was Bayard Rustin. Yes. And we're very proud of that as well. So keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next panel is Anaya Ray. Ananya. I'm sorry, is Ananya still here? Oh, okay, good. And Elizabeth Adams from Planned Parenthood. And Jenna Miller from Advocates for Children. And our next panel would be Kevin Dozier. Is he still here? Kevin? No? And Clayton John? Okay. Yeah, okay. Clayton, you want to come up now and then um, you can join this panel? Okay, can I ask you all to raise your right hand? I can swear you in. You swear, solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly. Yes. Okay, good. Ananya, let's start with you because you, you've been waiting a very long time and you may have to go from what I'm hearing. And just, can you turn that mic on and say your name into the mic so we know? Uh, my name is Ananya Roy. Uh, I'd like to say good afternoon to Chairman Drum and committee members. Um, I'm a sophomore at the Bronx High School of Science, and I'm a former Woo. member <laughs> School Pride, and um, I'm also a former member of the Manhattan Leadership Council. I also happen to identify as queer. Today I would like to share how being queer and being part of, the, of our school GSA at school um, has shaped my experience in school and at home. Prior to Bronx Science, I went to school at Eastside Middle School. Uh, in seventh grade, I figured out that I liked girls alongside boys. Suddenly, I had all these questions about my identity without anyone to talk to about it. I'd known from sixth grade that our school had a functioning GSA, but I, know so, I, but I saw no point in, in attending since I didn't see myself as part of the community or even think about LGBTQ plus issues. So I attended a couple of GSA sessions to see what I was getting myself into, and I fell in love with it. My GSA advisor, Alejandro Forigua, ran sessions that combined sharing um, personal experiences along with educating us about the LGBTQ plus community. As a queer Desi person, our situation can be especially debilitating with homophobia being extremely prevalent in our communities. I recall this one particular time uh, where my dad insisted that gay people were mentally ill and needed treatment. There are countless times where my uncle has been disgusted with his classmate because his classmate is gay and my uncle was angry because he had been touched by this classmate. Although it was painful, sharing all of that with the GSA, it helped me not to internalize the homophobia and it helped me validate my sexuality. Um, and on a, another note, my principal, Principal David Getz, had actually asked me if I wanted to you know, um, say that I was queer because I'm not out to my parents and he, he was worried that like, you know, I'd be taking a risk by, since this is, like, on, this is public record. Um, but, I'm sorry. By coming today? Yes. Um, but I chose to take that risk because this is something I'm very passionate about and this is something that impacts me and my friends greatly. Uh, so GSA was the one place that I felt safe and comfortable because I knew that I would never be able to come out to my parents without facing disastrous consequences. Without the support I found in GSA, I know my life would have spiraled downward to a much darker place, a place that too many people in my situation have found themselves. GSA also steered me from letting the subtle homophobia of my classmates get to me, such as when girls in PE would almost recoil if I made any contact with them. Or um, I remember this one particular moment where one of uh, an where upperclassman on the train was talking um, was insulting his teacher openly by using the uh, this D slur. I think you know what I'm referring to. Uh, this uh, the slur that. I don't want to say that. You could, uh, which word? Uh, begins with the D. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I heard the snickers that my classmates made behind my back because I spoke so openly about my queerness. But GSA was the one place where nobody criticized me, and my teachers were supportive all throughout um, middle school, and thankfully I've had the same experience in high school. 
And lastly, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to speak about my personal experience, and that I hope and I hope that you will see that how critical has a, a GSA has been, both in terms of creating a safe place for LGBTQ plus students and validating our identities, even when our friends, classmates, and our families may not. Wow, I'm totally amazed by your testimony and your courage to come down here and to do this. And um, it is public testimony, so you may be want to begin to think about if that possibility exists about dealing with your family. Did you come alone? Um, I came from school, yes. So are you, do you have a friend here with you now? Uh, no, I do not. Oh, uh, okay. Since I went a little bit late, uh, the, my other school that presented, uh, they had to leave. Yeah, and I didn't know that, that you were with the other school or I would have put you up on that panel with them it's as right. well, so I apologize to you for that. And I really thank you for staying and sharing this powerful story. You know, I represent one of the largest DESI communities as well in the city, Jackson Heights, you know. And um, I've run into a number of DESI students who have ex explained to me a lot of the difficulties about being a person of color in particular and uh, coming out to their families who oftentimes do not have any idea of what the movement, quote unquote, here in the United States or um, in New York City in particular is all about. And so um, we're particularly sensitive to that. And so hearing your testimony today is really, really important. And it's exactly why I held this hearing. It's for you. And I'm very moved. Thank you. I just want to say I, I agree with my chair on everything. You're so courageous. Sorry that you've had to go through some of the things that you've had to go through, and we want to. And your leadership has inspired the other uh, students at Eastside Middle School. Uh, you graduated before them, but they carried on to, to make it happen. And I think uh, we just want to make a world with you and others where uh, some of the things that you've brought up and some of the prejudice that you've run into from your own family and community can one day be a thing of the past. But thank you for your courage, because without you to tell your story, um, it makes, makes it easier for others when one person is courageous. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Adams. I'm the Director of Government Relations at Planned Parenthood of New York City. Uh, thank you to the council chair, um, the council member, Ben Kalos, uh, and to the committee as a whole. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you're very inspiring, and I feel very lucky to be on this panel with you. Thank you. Uh, as a leading sexual health educator, sorry, uh, you moved me so much. Uh, as, a, as a leading sexual health education provider, Planned Parenthood of New York City recognizes the importance of cultivating a supportive and inclusive school environment for all students to thrive and the key role that GSAs play in this work. One educator recently shared with me, I've seen firsthand the impact that having a, sta a space to be oneself and to feel safe doing so has on young folks. If we could provide the resources and support to create that space in all of our public schools, that would be game changing for so many people. During our sexual health education workshops, staff often hear questions that really boil down to, am I normal or am I safe? and really find that students usually just want to know that their bodies, their behaviors, and their identities are valid. Safety and understanding are core components of sexuality health education and need to be core components of a school's broader environment as well. And the need is urgent. Folks have already shared. Uh, the CDC reports that LGBT students are significantly more likely to experience violence, assaults, um, and be at risk for um, depression and absenteeism than peers, um, often for, because they don't feel safe for being who they are. Today's bills are proactive measures to connect students to gender and sexuality resources, support, and trusted teachers in New York City. We proudly support these efforts and hope that this legislation will serve as a useful tool for DOE to better liaise with schools on LGBT student inclusion measures more broadly. We would like to acknowledge, however, that for GSAs to provide safe spaces and support that young people deserve, they must be adequately resourced and invested in, which includes sufficient funding, teacher training, and resources, especially when we're talking about something on such a large scale of expanding to all middle and high schools. As such, PPNYC proposes the following recommendations. 
First, we recommend that GSA assigned staff receive training in trauma-informed care, gender and sexuality, and cultural responsiveness. Second, we recommend staff contacts be made available to DOE central staff to ensure clear and consistent communication. Um, it was great hearing about a lot of the, the plans and programs that um, Jared Fox was speaking to in terms of moving some of those programs and communication forward. Um, and so we would love to continue to encourage that. Uh, and then third, we recognize that extensive reporting can be burdensome on staff and may not always accurately rec reflect the meaningful work that's being done. Uh, and so we recommend that the meeting frequency and attendee number reporting requirements be lifted um, so that they may, because they may come off as a bit uh, misleading in terms of their findings. Lastly, we encourage the DOE's LGBT school liaison to facilitate GSA communication across schools and ensure that staff have all the tools they need to implement such a successful program. Again, we applaud the commitment to expand GSA citywide as a step toward a more holistic model of sexuality education that prioritizes health beyond just teaching a few lessons in 12th grade, but really connects young people to a range of resources needed to feel safe and to lead healthy and fulfilling lives. Thank you. Thank you, and as you know, this is the first step in the process, and we'll look at some of the recommendations that you're making, uh, and then amendments to the legislation will probably be made um, but we'll see. You know, I think one of the things that we're trying to get at with attendance as well is the number of students that we're serving, basically. Mm -hmm. So there may be another way to, to, to figure that out if that's a, a problem. So I'm sure we'll be talking. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jenna Miller, and I'm a staff attorney and Equal Justice Works Fellow at the School Justice Project at Advocates for Children of New York. I represent young people that are involved in bullying behavioral incidents, um, and I have a special focus on LGBTQ students and students with disability. I also provide trainings to parents, students, and professionals on bullying behavior. Um, each year, we help thousands of parents navigate the education system, and we receive numerous calls on our helpline about bullying behavior and the DOE's failure to address bullying behavior in certain schools. While AFC has always provided advice and trainings on bullying, my fellowship is enabling us to address the issue more systematically. We appreciate the City Council's efforts to make schools um, safer and more inclusive places through this resolution and introduction. GSAs provide vital identity-affirming spaces to gender non-conforming students, LGBTQ students, and allies who are disproportionately affected by bullying behavior. GSAs help prevent bullying behavior by making clear that GNC and LGBTQ students are valuable members of the school community and by creating a forum for these students to develop leadership skills and inclusivity strategies to use within their school communities. GSAs also foster inclusive school communities by helping these students identify and engage with supportive school staff and other adults. G Bolstering and expanding support for GSAs will make schools healthier learning environments, but additional steps are needed. Another way to make schools safe for all students is by better training st students, staff members, and parents about how to report bullying behavior and how schools must respond when bullying behavior occurs. In order to comply with state law, and in New York State, that's DASA, the DOE developed an anti-bullying program called Respect for All, which many other people have discussed today. And that requires each school to designate one staff member as an RFA liaison. Each year, the RFA liaison needs to be trained in anti-bullying laws, regulations, and strategies, and they need to turnkey this information within their school community. Over the past few years, though, our helpline staff has fielded an increasing number of calls from families that their child has continued to experience bullying despite reporting it to school staff. In our experience in working on, on bullying issues, Families and even school staff are typically unaware of who an RFA liaison is at their school or even that the role exists in the first place. On top of that, on August 31, 2016, the State Attorney General and the State Education Department issued a joint Dear Colleague letter analyzing data reported by school districts pursuant to the State um, Dignity for All Students Act, and it suggests that school districts 
particularly New York City, um, is significantly underreporting the number of bullying incidents. Um, and this shows a need to improve DASA training and awareness that DASA even exists. So a costless step that the DOE should take to expand awareness about this program is just by putting the name and contact information of each RFA liaison on each school's website. In addition to improving awareness about this program, um, it also helps DOE schools comply with the law. DASA requires that the name and contact of information for each DASA coordinator, and in New York City, that's the RFA liaison, um, needs to be posted on the school's internet website. Therefore, we urge City Council to call upon the DOE to post the name and contact information of each school's RFA liaison on each school's online school portal. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. That's an excellent suggestion, and I earlier made a suggestion about uh, collecting data and information about uh, GSAs through the uh, Respect for All liaison as well, and I think that would really be a, an easy to implement type of suggestion. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, just make comment about as well in terms of your testimony was with the, um, the DASA reporting. There were some schools that were reporting no bullying at all. I mean, how could that be? Like, you know, <laughs> it just can't be, you know. So we do need to educate folks better on how to do that reporting. And then there is a piece, and I don't know how we deal with this ultimately with DASA reporting, um, that um, is concerning to me. I don't believe with DASA reporting that it's tracked for sexual orientation, the, 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 um, the, the type of bullying that uh, might occur. And it, unfortunately, we can't get a feel for what's happening in the school. And I think if, with LGBT bullying, and you might have been here for the whole hearing, oftentimes, because it's not tracked in that sense either, the LGBT words are not spoken in the school, and therefore, um, it's just, it remains a, a whole situation of ignorance about bullying based on LGBT issues. And I'm of firm belief that unless you say lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender in the classroom, it's assumed that, you know, it's still okay to be able to do that. So I'd love to be able to at some point try to figure out a way that we could track LGBT bullying so that we can say as well, you know, this issue actually needs to be addressed. Interestingly enough, too, the young man that was sitting here before, said it was number two in his school, second to, um, I forget what the first issue was. Body uh, shaming. Yeah, right, right body weight shaming. Um, and, and I believe it, it could even be higher in other places as well and, and be number one in some of the schools. But, but thank you for your testimony, I appreciate it. Thank you. Next, please. Yes, uh, my name is Clayton John, I'm a concerned parent. You know, I'm amazed that you have this um, discussion about um, LGP, LGB, um, concerns in the schools and the bullying that they receive, but I don't see the end result of the bullying that they say they take place, harassment. But you have a whole penal system where you have Latino, black and Latino incarcerated, and you don't see the connection with what's going on in the school system, all right? I mean, they say clubs, but when it comes to our schools, they're gangs, and just for the same reason of fear. That fear don't come because they weren't bullied, but nobody's addressing that. But you're going to establish rules and regulations for a more. Let me just stop you because you yes. might not know who I am, but I've been the lead person to expose what happened on Rikers Island, and it's one of my major pieces of legislation that I've been into the city council. I began to visit Rikers Island in 2011, I believe, to yes. try to draw attention to and to expose what was happening on Rikers Island. Fortunately, with this speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, uh, her help in terms of uh, establishing a commission to shut down Rikers Island at my insistence and working together with her is what got us to the point where we had the Lipman report and we were able to establish that Rikers Island, in fact, needs to be shut down. It's the belief of myself as the chair of this committee that the issues are interrelated and that there's an intersectionality of issues there as well. So I just wanted you to know that that's my position as the chair, that the issues that you just mentioned yes. are issues of major importance to me as well. Yes, because that's the end result. I mean, there's a connection with what's taking place in the school to where they end up in the end, right? But when I hear the speakers here, guess what? The LGBT community still becomes successful. 
I mean, it's not to say, I mean, when I hear the schools they come from, um, uh, Stuyvesant, Bronx High School of Science, Brooklyn Tech, these are successful schools. So in spite of that, they are going to be successful in, in the long run, I mean, as adults. But I can say to you, the majority of Latino and blacks are not going to be successful. The, 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 the incarceration rate is very high. The low incomes, we already know of low income families, if, that because of what's taking place at the children at the lowest level, where they're going to end up. They're going to be successful here. Now, that's what I want to say because when I say them, I'm waiting for an end result. You got bullied and what happened? No, I, I don't hear end result. They're going to be successful. But there's laws that you're going to, you're going to put laws for their sake when you have a whole system of, of other children who supposedly you, you put discipline and laws of discipline and conduct in place already, but yet still they're priority school, focus schools, violent schools, where they attend. The schools that these children attend right now are not violent. Because we would hear things like that. Now, I want to say that... But you understand that the majority of the students that are LGBT in the system are probably students of color because the majority of students in the system are students of color. It could be, but that's not the way they make the statistics. They focus on the fact that they're from low-income families, and, that, and based on that, this is where they're going to end up. But that's not, that, they never even say that. But that's what I'm saying. They, they it could be, but that's not the way you, you're designing statistics. And when they talk about they come from conservative families, and that's what it was very rough, you know, to tell you the truth, our society is based on basic and simple law. I say basic. From, I mean, I tell my child, you know, society is going to get very chaotic. But I tell you, look at, look at nature, and you can always be grounded because that doesn't change. From the basic cell itself, you procreate. I don't know what to say. I mean, you, whether you do that instinctively or not, you actually start to, whether we do it of nature, whatever you, you do, yeah. Well, I guess that's just what I wanted to say. Okay, good. Thank you. And you know what I just want to say is that um, it's really important to say what we're trying to do here is to uh, enforce the law. In New York City, it is illegal to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, race, national origin, uh, immigration status, etc. And what this hearing has been about, basically, is to ensure that our schools are free from any type of discrimination. And that's basically what we were trying to get at today. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and with that, uh, we are going to adjourn this meeting. It is now 3.43 in the afternoon. Thank you very much. You're welcome.